भगवते वासुदेवा भगवते वासुदेवा दिस इज नॉट द वर्स दट आई एम गोन रीड सो डोंट लुक देर लुक ओवर हेयर टुनाइट वी आर गोइंग टू स्पीक ऑन श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो सेवन चैप्टर फोर्टीन which is entitled ideal family life text 10 <clears throat> you can repeat tri tri vargam tri vargam tri vargam na na ati krichchena krichchena Nati Krishna, Tri Vargam Nati Krishna, Tri Vargam Nati Krishna, Bajeta, Griha, Media, Api. Bajet griha medya pi Bajet griha medya pi Yata desham Yata kalam Yata desham Yata kalam Yata desham Yata kalam दैव प्रपादित दैव प्रपादित दैव प्रपादित श्री वर्गम नति कृष्ण बजेत गृह मेद्यपि यथादेशम यथा कालम यावत धैव प्रपादित थ्री वर्गम three principles three. namely religiosity <laughs> economic development <laughs> and sense gratification <laughs> na <laughs> not <laughs> ati krishna <laughs> by very severe endeavor <laughs> Bajeta should execute Griha Medi a person interested only in family life Api although Yatha Desham according to the place Yatha Kalam according to the time yavat as much as dahiva by the grace of the lord upapaditam obtained translation and purport by his divine grace ac bhakti vedanta swami prabhupad even if one is a householder rather than a brahmachari a sanyasi or a vanaprastha one should not endeavor very hard for religiosity economic development or satisfaction of the senses even in householder life one should be satisfied to maintain body and soul together with whatever is available with minimum endeavor according to place and time by the grace of the lord one should not engage oneself in ugra karma purport by shila prabhupad in human life there are four principles to be fulfilled dharma artha kama and moksha religion economic development sense gratification and liberation first one should be religious observing various rules and regulations 
and then one must earn some money for maintenance of his family and the satisfaction of his senses. The most important ceremony for sense gratification is marriage because sexual intercourse is one of the principal necessities of the material body. Yan maitunadi grihamedi sukam hitutcham. Although sexual intercourse is not a very exalted requisite in life, both animals and men require some sense gratification because of material propensities. One should be satisfied with married life and not expend energy for extra sense gratification or sex life. It is a long purport. I will speak a little bit uh, in each section. Of course, these are important teachings by the great devotee Prahlad Maharaj. Uh, Prahlad Maharaj uh, is one of the great uh, instructors uh, of civilized persons. And he is discussing here uh, what is the primary goal of life. And he informs us that first of all, uh, we should understand that the basic principle of material existence is sense gratification. And the basic principle of spiritual advancement is to become free from such sense gratification. We may speak philosophy, we may consider ourselves to be advanced, but if the desire for sense gratification is still continuing within the heart, this is not a very good sign. Of course, uh, to automatically or immediately give up sense gratification is not easy. We see that in various <clears throat> religious systems, there is some license for sense gratification. Uh, any scripture you read, you will find uh, that there are rules and regulations to regulate sense gratification. It is never said no sense gratification. Uh, but rather there is restriction placed on sense gratification. So uh, the Vedic literatures are mostly concerned with such restrictions. They are under the rules of the laws of material nature. Uh, persons who are uh, predominantly influenced by ignorance or passion or goodness uh, are enabled to become free from sense gratification gradually. Uh, if we simply say give up sense gratification no one will follow, no one will be able to follow. Uh, just like we see that in the treatment of a disease uh, there is a gradual tre tre treating of the disease. Uh, not some immediate cure. Of course, we like in the West to get some immediate cure. Americans are very fond of pushing a button and expecting some result. But the Indian system of medicine treats the disease in a very systematic and methodical way and slowly. The cure naturally develops through Ayurvedic medicine or some other method and gradually treats the disease. In the same way, the great sages of the past have recommended that sense gratification or the desires, material desires, are like a disease. Uh, in the nectar of the uh, instruction, it is mentioned that uh, we have normally a natural, in, in our original condition, the holy name of the Lord is very sweet. But at the present moment, we are not tasting the sweetness of God's name. Why? Because, according to Srila Rupa Goswami, we are afflicted by a disease. And that disease is materialism. In some societies, materialism is a religion. It is a religion. In fact, in some ways we can say that materialism has become the religion of the present Kali Yuk. We were speaking this afternoon that even uh, religious buildings, churches or other places have to adopt so many types of uh, materialistic allurements to get the people to come. We learn that there are bowling alleys in churches, there are swimming pools in churches, there are health clubs 
in churches. And I don't know what else. I haven't been to those places. But practically, unless they introduce all of these types of activities, no one is interested. No one is interested. In a way, the same thing is being done by the Vedic sages. Maybe not as grossly as a bowling alley or a health club or a swimming pool, but they're doing something. Uh, they're giving some license for enjoyment and with the title Dharma, religion. Just like, what is a wife called? Dharma Patni. Right? But actually, what is the purpose of marriage? Now you can say marriage is for advancement. But, and it is for advancement, but at the same time, ultimately marriage for the soul, you know, we cannot argue marriage is required for the pure spirit soul. It's not required for the pure spirit soul. Nothing material within this world is required for the pure soul. But the pure soul at present is within a body. And that material body has some needs. So marriage may be required for such a material body. Now, therefore, material body may require a husband or a wife. And by adding the word dharma to the wife or to the husband, it informs us that the purpose of this marriage is religious. It is religious. Just like I would think, I think, that the people who have that church bowling alley would argue that this bowling alley is for religion. Now you may say, well, I don't think there's a very favorable comparison to marriage with a bowling alley. Well, the poor purpose is the same. It takes into account the material desires or needs of a person. But there's some difference. It would be very hard to justify how throwing a bowl, ball down an alley and knocking off pins is giving pleasure to God. It would be hard to establish how bowling balls, you know, is somehow devotional service to God. Is our system in the new hall going to do this also? You're not supposed to laugh. Testing, testing. Yet so many little microphones and never turned on this microphone. <laughs> Hare Krishna. So, on the other hand, we can see how marriage has service to God and is pleasing to God because it produces Krishna conscious children. Or husband and wife encourage each other. Well, in terms of encouragement, we could argue that bowling balls in a bowling alley in the inside a church also encourages one to go to church. So I think we would have to say that the real benefit of married life comes from producing Krishna conscious children. That's the most beneficial part. Now we have to see Dharma Patni and how is this Dharma? What is the nature of Dharma? Uh, dharma, Dharman to Shakshat Bhagavat Pranitan. The nature of religion is that it must emanate from God. As soon as human beings try to uh, concoct or create or imagine religious rules, they, the, the rules are not absolute. One of the main problems with religious teachings are very often that they're human made. They're made by human beings. Now, this is a big controversy amongst scholars. 
they argue that religion is not made by God. You see? They say it's not made by God. It's made by human beings. And they try to uh, do scholarship in terms of literary uh, scholarship. They study the text and they try to demonstrate how these texts were created or constructed by human beings. Or they do historical scholarship. They show that at such and such time this influence was there and therefore the things happen like this. Just like they'll take Bhagavad Gita. And they'll show how some of the arguments from Bhagavad Gita are based on Patanjali's yoga system. Or some of the arguments in Bhagavad Gita are responses to the teachings of the Buddhists. In other words, the Bhagavad Gita is obviously, according to them, after Buddhism and after Patanjali. Perhaps it was written by someone, put together by a number of different persons, within the last 2,000 years. Now, how do you like that? That's certainly not our view. So you're all laughing. And you want me to tear it apart. It will be torn apart, but it will have to be torn apart. We can just say, that's a bunch of nonsense. Whoever said that are simply a pack of demons. You can say that. We can, and everybody here will agree with you. But the problem is that outside of here, not everybody will agree with you. We have no problem convincing ourselves. But the real trick is that we have to convince all these people that say these things. And it can be done. And it will be done. It has to be done in a very scholarly way to demonstrate how the Bhagavad Gita is actually spoken by Lord Sri Krishna. And how Krishna came within this world 5,000 years ago. These things can be done, presented even in a scholarly way, but it will take some effort. In any case, here the point being made is that uh, Dharma originates from God uh, and it is religious principle because it comes from God, not because it comes from humans. If it comes from humans, it won't be Dharma. Human beings cannot create religious principles. God creates religious principles. And if we adhere to the principles taught by God, then automatically our path becomes progressive. So the Grihasta Ashram, the Brahmachari Ashram, the Sannyas Ashram, the Vanaprast Ashram, these are considered to be different parts of the body of God. Just as Brahmins, Kshatriya, Vaishyas, and Sutras are different parts of the body of God. And each one of them has their proper function. Just like Grihastha Dharma. What is a Grihastha supposed to do? Give in charity. To maintain the other ashramas. This is, this is how a Grihastha makes advancement. And how does a sannyasi make advancement? He travels, preaches, enlightens the public. How does a brahmachari make advancement? By offering menial service to the sannyasi. How does the vanaprastha make advancement? By gradually retiring from the responsibilities of family life and simply fixing their minds on service to the Supreme Lord. Each ashrama has their duties. And although these duties, I have mentioned very spiritual duties, but the duties are actually all spiritual because they're connected for a spiritual purpose, progressive spiritual life. So husband and wife may be allowed sense gratification in the form of sex life, but the sex life is for producing Krishna conscious children. Husband and wife may be allowed to live in a nice home, but the purpose of that home is to raise the family uh, and, and educate them in Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> Each and every part of the Grihastha's life or the sannyasi's life is meant to be progressive. The beauty of Krishna consciousness is that it takes things which are material and engages them in the service of God and they become spiritualized. The tendency for sex life may be there, but if the sex life is used for producing Krishna conscious children, it is not ordinary mundane activity. Nor is any activity which we do. A person goes out and works. Now working in the material world means you have to become entangled. But if the results of the work, that is to say, the money which is earned is utilized in the service of Krishna, it is not material. 
and has no karmic reaction whatsoever. So, uh, this is encouraging. It is encouraging because without this opportunity to engage things which are material in the service of God, it would be very difficult for us to make advancement in our present condition. We are not so advanced that we can simply sit and do bhajan all day. It would be very difficult to do that. Prabhupada gives the example that when he had uh, a small child, uh, one person came and told his child that if you stay still for 30 seconds, I will give you, you know, whatever it was, a rupee or some sweet. And the boy, for even 30 seconds, could not stay still. Because the mind is always active, the body is always active, and we are always wanting to do many things. If we simply sit and try to chant, just like Prabhupada said in the beginning, chant 64 rounds, nobody could do it. Very difficult. But if you tell someone, go out and work, and give the results of your work to Krishna, immediately everyone says, that I can do. And Krishna told Arjuna that. You go out onto the battlefield and fight. So you consider what are your activities and how they can be of use to Krishna. If they're simply for your own material maintenance and there's no transcendental connection, then you have to be in anxiety. We should try to see how we can connect and draw the activities to Krishna. And that will help us to chant Hare Krishna. If we only meditate on our material maintenance, that will not purify our consciousness. But if we feel that I have a mission, uh, my guru's mission is my life and soul. And within my own uh, particular occupation or activity, I want to assist my guru in his mission. And then you'll be able to uh, get benefit for when you chant and when you do other activities. Those activities become Krishna conscious. And Prabhupada talks about that. As for economic development, the responsibility for this should be entrusted mainly to the Vaishyas and Grihastas. Human society should be divided into Varnas and Ashramas. Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, and Sannyasa. Economic development is necessary for Grihastas. Brahman Grihastas should be satisfied with the life of Adhyayana, Adhyapana, and Yajana, and Yajana. Being learned scholars, teaching others to be scholars, learning how to worship the Supreme Personality of God at Vishnu, and also teaching others how to worship Lord Vishnu or even the demigods. Very interesting comment. A Brahmana should do this without remuneration, but he is allowed to accept charity from a person whom he teaches how to be a human being. As for the Kshatriyas, they are supposed to be the kings of the land, and the land should be distributed to the Vaishyas for agricultural activities, cow protection, and trade. Shudras must work. Sometimes they should engage in occupational duties as cloth manufacturers, weavers, blacksmiths, goldsmiths, brass smiths, and so on. Or else they should engage in hard labor to produce food grains. This is Prabhupada's statement about economic activities. So economic activities are largely the function of the Vaishya class. Um, and if we consider that, we will have to acknowledge the fact that nowadays most people are engaged in Shudra activity. Like it or not. That's the reality. Even, you know, professionals who are highly rewarded for their services are actually and classified as Shudras, most of them. A Vaishya uh, does either till the land or protect the cows or trade the products. He's a businessman. And a Kshatriya, you know, is giving protection to the citizens, the Praja, and uh, this is actually Kshatriya Dharma. And Brahmins, we have heard intellectual activities. So most people are not doing any one of those three. Most people are Shudras. Whether you call them, you know, highly skilled professionals or not, that's another case. Now you may say that's not a very polite thing to say. If we go around and tell all our members you're just a Shudra, they may take exception and offense to our statement. But, 
The fact is it is not in any way an impediment to spiritual advancement. Krishna says they can all approach the supreme destination. Kalawa Sudra Sambhava. Everyone in the Kali Yuga is born as a Shudra. It's not disqualification. Because one who is a Vaishnava is automatically elevated beyond the Varnas and Ashramas. Beyond. However, for if we make designation that you're a Shudra or you're a Brahmin uh, to a Vaishnava, that is not a very proper thing to do. When we deal with Vaishnavas, we should see them as transcendental to the Varnashram system. We should not classify Vaishnavas that you are better than this, this person is better than that person. We should give respect to Vaishnava uh, as beyond its designation. It is said that anyone who sees the deity as made of stone, uh, or um, the guru as an ordinary person, or Vaishnava as being born in a particular place or designating him, Naramati Vaishnava Jati He has the mentality which is fit for going downwards into hell. So, why is Prabhupada mentioning these categories? Because for most people, uh, they may come to the Vaishnava platform by doing their duty according to their dharma, Varnashram dharma. Prabhupada said that for ordinary society, for organizing material society, there must be Varnashram dharma. Most persons cannot come to the transcendental platform. Therefore, it is better to inform them what is their dharma. Just like we see, most people cannot follow all of our rules and regulations. Then let them act according to Varna and Ashram. At least it is progressive. Let them be. I did it. Now you see in the world, people cannot be proper grihastas. And there's no question of brahmacharis out there or sannyasis. So let them act as grihastas. Let them take, therefore Prabhupada said, get married and be a proper husband or wife. Or, and if you're a grihasta, give in charity. Now, if someone can come to the point of Brahman, very good. But to be a Brahmin without being a Vaishnava is very difficult. And what is the duty, what is the quality of a Brahmin? Doesn't take any salary, lives on charity, and lives very simply. For most people, it's difficult to be Brahminical. We're inclined to want so many things. But we should know what is the value of these things. Very temporary. Very flimsy. One has to reduce material wants and necessities and increase one's interest in Krishna. And how do we increase that interest in Krishna? By doing these duties and gradually by surrendering. The whole principle of Varnashram Dharma is to gradually train one to be submissive, to give up one's uh, independent spirit and gradually become more and more focused on surrender. The ultimate principle is surrender to Guru, surrender to Vaishnavas, surrender to Bhagavan. But it's a gradual process. At least one should uphold the principles of Varnashram Dharma. If one say, I'm surrendered to Guru or Vaishnavas, but I don't do Varnashram Dharma, then what is the meaning of that? And then there will be a religion. Now you can point many examples, of course. Even in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna wanted to uphold Varnashram Dharma and Krishna said, no, just surrender unto me. But if we're going to break principles of Varnashram Dharma, then it should be for a higher purpose. If it's not for a higher purpose, it becomes irreligion. In the case of Krishna telling Arjuna to kill his relatives, that is a transgression of Varnashram. But it was for a higher purpose. So we, have to, we cannot quote on the one hand an example like Krishna telling Arjuna to go beyond Varnashram Dharma and use that as a justification for our own irreligious behavior. And that won't be appropriate. We can't claim, I'm transcendental. 
I'll read the balance. These are the different occupational duties by which men should earn their livelihood. And in this way, human society should be simple. At the present moment, however, everyone is engaged in technological advancement, which is described in Bhagavad Gita as Ugra Karma, extremely severe endeavor. This Ugra Karma is the cause of agitation within the human mind. Men are engaging in many sinful activities and becoming degraded by opening slaughterhouses, breweries, and cigarette factories, as well as nightclubs and other establishments for sense enjoyment. In this way, they are spoiling their lives. In all these activities, of course, householders are involved, and therefore it is advised here, with the use of the word api, that even though one is a householder, one should not engage himself in severe hardships. One's means of livelihood should be extremely simple. As for those who are not grihastas, the brahmacharis, manaprasas, and sannyasis, they don't have to do anything but strive for advancement in spiritual life. This means that three-fourths of the entire population should stop sense gratification and simply be engaged in the advancement of Krishna consciousness. Only one-fourth of the population should be grihastas, and there should be according to laws of restricted sense gratification. The grihastas, vanaprastas, brahmacharis, and sannyasis should endeavor together with their total energy to become Krishna conscious. This type of civilization is called daiva varnashrama. One of the objectives of the Krishna consciousness movement is to establish this daiva varnashrama, but not to encourage so-called varnashrama without scientifically organized endeavor by human society. If one is brahmachari, sannyasi, avanaprastha, only business is spiritual advancement. And only the grihastas are permitted uh, to consider sense gratification, and uh, then only in a restricted way. This is progressive. Prabhupada says that even the grihastas should keep their needs to a minimum. So that, I think our devotees are trying to do that, and I think they are successful for that reason. Uh, as far as I have seen, as soon as one begins to chant Hare Krishna, one develops a certain type of detachment as well as transcendental intelligence, by which one realizes that material sense gratification will only make me more miserable. And I see practically our devotees uh, are living simply. But in addition to this simple living, there has to be some taste. That taste comes from devotional association and devotional activity. It is very important that we live in such a way that we get each other's association. Just like a spark, if it goes out of the fire, can become extinguished. So if we keep too much away from the devotee's association, the spark of our Krishna consciousness may become extinguished. Therefore, we are trying to create this Hare Krishna Dham, a community of devotees, where we can constantly meet each other. Uh, our neighbors can be devotees. Our car, when it goes to work, will have to pass the temple. We'll, for one reason or another, we'll have so many reasons to come here and associate amongst each other in Krishna consciousness. And this will help us to become advanced. Otherwise, if we keep ourselves separate, then naturally we will forget Krishna at this stage. We're not yet at the stage of realization where Krishna is so firmly fixed in our mind that we cannot forget him. If we are not very attentive, we may lose sight of Krishna very easily. So we should not allow that to happen. Are there any questions? You don't all have to raise your hands. Okay. Having this is perverted uh, in the spiritual world. So there is family life in spiritual world too. This time is devotees. But this is a reflection of family life in the world. If we make our family here, Iskan is not we should understand that his Iskan is a spiritual family. Iskan is not a perversion. At least it's not meant to be a perversion of spiritual family life. Because in ISKCON we see Krishna is at the center of the family. 
and we're all members of Krishna's family. So, ISKCON is a reflection, not a perverted reflection, but it is a reflection of what is truly there in the spiritual world. Here we see, just like husband and wife are together, but they're more attracted to see the deity than to look at each other. And that is a sign of what it is like in the spiritual world. We learn that they're also, there is husband and wife, but they find God more attractive than each other. So actually we see Krishna consciousness is already like the spiritual world. Another thing? The other person, yeah, if one person drops Krishna consciousness, then the spouse, the other person, should continue to be a good example. And by their good example, the uh, husband or wife who has uh, fallen away will gradually take interest again. Krishna consciousness is very difficult to give up altogether. It becomes dormant for some time. Once one has begun to practice Krishna consciousness, it goes very deep. It may be covered for some time, but it will come up. So one should be very patient with that person, and gradually, by good example, they will take interest again. Don't lose hope. Another question? Yes? With uh, our children in regular schools, where they being, uh, teach such a different way of living, it's very hard for them to go every day and say yes to everything they teach in the new So, uh, the children are in, the children are, uh, exposed to uh, many to a very materialistic society but if at home they see a spiritual example then that spiritual example will uh, enable them to uh, compare they can compare the two if when they come home the same thing they see is what they have seen at school then there's no contrast but I think that if they come home to a very Krishna conscious environment They'll appreciate it. So it's your duty to make your home so nice that when your children come home, they see that this is actually the way I like it more. And you have to have good answers to their questions. You can ask them, what did you learn today? And see if their, you know, what they learned uh, was only explained in one way, in a one-sided way. You can explain the other view, the other version to them. Children are intelligent and reasonable. So if they hear the explanations of Krishna consciousness alongside of materialistic explanations, I think that they will choose Krishna consciousness. That's the best that you can do. And feed them prasadam. Another question? Sometimes it seems that the Shiva Prabhupada's purpose describes our actions as we're discussing and necessity for Krishna consciousness. And sometimes he seems to discourage us as an impossibility to this age. Yeah. Yes. It is not possible to follow Varnashram perfectly. But some semblance of it can be followed. But Varnashram is ultimately something that has to be left behind. As a pure devotee, we eventually become transcendental to all conceptions of Varnashram Dharma. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I'm none of these things. I'm not a Brahmin, I'm not a Vaishya Sudra, Grihastha, etc. I'm simply the servant of the servant of Krishna, the master of the gopis. So ultimately we have to come to the real identity of being the eternal servant of the Lord. But to whatever degree Varnashram is helpful, we should follow it. But we should not whimsically give it up. One should not give up, according to Bhakti Thakur, one should not give up Varnashram Dharma until one is liberated. 
If one tries to give it up prematurely, one will fall down. They'll become overcome by material desires. So one should be intelligent in this regard and see this point. Otherwise, to simply try for something beyond one's means will, will be disastrous. Your pujari is ready. I, is it clock fast or something? Ten minutes fast? No. Your clock is. Uh, well. Last question. All right, we can get ready for the RT. Srila Prabhupada Ki, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki, 